Today, what we're hoping to discuss with our panelists is more focused on the practical realities of how to create change in education finance systems at the state level and how to overcome some of the political barriers that can often make that change hard to come by. Uh, this can happen in a lot of different ways through bills and state legislatures, through judicial rulings, through a combination of both. Uh, but even when change seems fast, often that is years of work behind the scenes that made that happen. Uh, so today we'll hear from two panelists who've been deeply involved in education reforms in their respective states in different roles. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it to my colleague, Jennifer Sheese, who will introduce herself and our panelists and moderate the discussion. Uh, please know that we're gonna have some time uh, for audience questions. So if you have any questions along the way for our panel, please do drop them in the Q&A and we'll be monitoring that. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Bonnie, appreciate that. And welcome everybody, excited to have this conversation today. Um, I will preview at the outset that there's some construction going on in my background very inconveniently, so I will do my best to, to play the mute game effectively. Um, but I'll introduce myself first and then excited to introduce our, our two panelists today. Um, I'm Jen Sheese, I'm a partner on the policy and evaluation team at Beltweather Education. Uh, here at Bellwether, I work on a range of issues that fall into the very broad bucket of state education policy, but I do spend a sizable chunk of my time focused on state school finance equity. I got interested in this work in my time as nonpartisan legislative staff in Texas, where I worked on various aspects of the state's public education budget and school finance system for a little over a decade. And in that time, part of my job was to support school funding debates by providing and explaining the analysis on the impact of proposals for school finance reform, uh, both at the statewide and down to the district level. I, I was the, the person who brought the, the, the poorly named district runs um, out to, to legislators. Um, and having played a, a role in the complex work of school funding reform, I'm particularly excited about today's conversation with two people who represent a couple of the key actors in those processes, policymakers themselves and the advocates who are working to influence policy change. And we'll be digging into their respective roles in school funding reform efforts in their states and get their thoughts and advice on the factors that enable this kind of reform to move forward. Today, we're focusing less on the what in terms of what is in terms of what is the right state school funding policy, and much more on the how of moving policy change in an area that's very complex, affects every legislative district and every constituent in a state, and typically represents the largest investment of state dollars in the budget. So first I'd like to welcome Jamila Prince Stewart, who is the Executive Director of Faith Acts for Education in Connecticut. A Connecticut native, her professional career started working directly with young people with the Hartford Youth Scholars Foundation. And from there, she moved to focus on more systemic issues as Director of Community Engagement at CONCAN, a state education advocacy organization. And in that work, she created a clergy organizing initiative that eventually led to the creation of Faith Acts for Education, where she leads advocacy focusing on equity and opportunity in education for Black, Brown, and low-income students across the state, including school funding equity. And I'm also happy to be joined by John Cullerton, who served 11 years as the president of the Illinois State Senate, which was the capstone of a legislative career spanning over 40 years. He began in the State House in 1979 and was elected to the Senate in 1991, representing a district that includes Wrigley Field in Chicago, a little landmark for any baseball fans who may be joining us today. Uh, with a reputation as a skilled negotiator and with willingness to work across the aisle for bipartisan solutions, he has many legislative accomplishments to his credit, both in education and beyond, but today we're here to talk about his work on school funding reform in the state. So welcome to both of you and thanks for joining us today. Excited for this conversation. Want to give each of you a little bit of a chance to introduce yourselves um, and give us a little bit about your state context in terms of school funding reform and your role in recent successes in moving these complicated pieces of policy forward. Um, and I will start with Jamila. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're still in Zoom meeting, um, so it's the beginning of the year, but we're all feeling that Zoom fatigue, but just great to be a part of this conversation. Again, I am Jamila Prince-Stewart. 
the founding executive director of Faith Acts for Education, and we are people of faith building power to get our children the education they deserve. Um, we represent 80 congregations, um, 500 members, and 5,000 committed voters in the state of Connecticut. I'm a New Haven native, I'm born here, I'm lived here, went to college here, I'm still live here, right? So I'm really committed to the state um, and to equity in the state and have personally experiences personal experiences of what inequity uh, means, not just for me, but I like to remind people like I'm still desperately trying to educate my own family, still stuck in schools, not meeting their needs. Um, so a bit about context in Connecticut, I think, you know, across the country, when people think Connecticut, they think Greenwich, Connecticut, they think well, um, they think white. Um, and Connecticut looks very different than I think what outsiders perceive it to be. Um, in terms of our school finance, um, it's unfortunate, but like we have one of the largest wealth gaps in the state, excuse me, in the country. And we are one of the most segregated states based on race and income in the country as well. And so, right, like that obviously impacts our school finance system. So um, we're about the size of our total student population is about the size of LA Unified School District. And we divided our students up um, and our towns and municipalities up about 169 times, right? And that's overwhelmingly based on race and on class and on keeping certain people out of certain spaces, right? So redlining, all of those terms. And that obviously doesn't just impact education, it impacts children, it impacts jobs, it impacts community, right? And like connectivity between people. And I think for education, I'm 35 this year and our education cost sharing formula, I think is about the same age as me. Um, and that's the mechanism through which the state says, okay, like we have all these different towns and municipalities divided up. They have different abilities to raise local tax revenue. So like the state is gonna create a system in which we can bring equity to in terms of resources for education across the state regardless of where a child lives and what their economic background is um it's uh as old as me it's also been tweaked as many times as my age and its age so it's been tweaked over 30 times overwhelmingly for political reasons and a few years ago we completely stopped using it and every year, just like in the budget, gave a line item to each and every single district. So how was that decided? Who had the most, right? Like who had the most power in terms of um, at the legislature and the uh, specific like senators and uh, state representatives and what they could get for their community. So that created a huge gap in terms of what we spend to educate white students and what we spend to educate students of color. Um, so last year, unfortunately, the gap has grown. But last year, when we began to do some really critical advocacy work around this, there was a $640 million gap between what Connecticut spent to educate white students and what Connecticut spent to educate black, brown, and brown and other students color, indigenous, et cetera. And so um, I worked on a coalition um, with a coalition of other organizations that I know we'll get into more um, to fix that. And what I'm really excited that we were able to do last year um, was to get the legislature in the middle of um, a very intense budget year, in the middle of uh, billions of federal dollars coming into the state to put 160.2 million more dollars into education, specifically targeting black, brown, and low income students, especially schools of choice. Um, so I'll talk a bit more as we get there about what that looks like and what we were able to accomplish. And also a lot of work that still needs to happen um, to really make sure that we have an equitable funding system in Connecticut. Thanks, Jamila, I really appreciate that. And I'm making a note to myself, I definitely wanna come back to that budget point and the role that sort of budget dynamics play in, in these conversations. John, I would invite you to, to offer some introductions, some context on your work on school finance in Illinois. Jennifer, thank you very much. And Jamal, it's an honor to be out here with you guys. It's uh, probably one of the most important things that state government does, obviously, is fund education. We're the largest supporter of education. And yet, um, it's all governed by statutes. It's all governed by passing laws. The state's the one that's got the money and has to appropriate it. And I kind of, you know, I was in the legislature for 41 years, Senate president for 11 years. I kind of love the, the process. And uh, we had what was described, of course, by others uh, as the worst funding form in the nation, just totally um, uh, uh, 
skewed towards the wealthier school districts. So in order to change that, we, um, we had a, it wasn't me because I was the chairman of the, of the, of the, of the, of my own caucus kind of in the middle representing everybody. Uh, that's what legislative leaders do, but also working with, you know, the other, uh, the minority party. And we did have a legislator who was a champion and the interest groups were very critical as well. So, um, and I can, you know, get into details using that as an example about uh, Jennifer, you've worked in Texas, uh, Jamal in, in Connecticut. Um, every state's different in a way, but in, this, in a way it's also the, true that the money comes from the state and the process is, is uh, complicated. That is very true. Um, so I wanna start kind of at the beginning because I think sort of the, the catalyst for, for creating the ability to sort of move these kinds of reforms forward can vary from context to context. Sometimes it's a lawsuit, sometimes it's a budget crisis, sometimes it's a budget surplus. Um, and would love to hear from your perspectives, kind of what, what was that catalyst and or the, the kind of front end work required to create the conditions to even bro broker, broker the debate? Jamila, I would love to start with you and, and have you give us a little bit of sort of what led to the conditions that enabled change. Yep. So the um, really historic um, bill that we were able to get implemented into the budget last year has been a long time coming in Connecticut. Um, I only came into this space, I graduated from college in 2009, and I think I started working at ConCan in late 2010, early 2011, and this was the thing that we were working on, right? So like, this is a decade of work that I've at least been involved in to get to this point. And I think that, um, you know, one thing that we say in community organizing, do you want to be right or do you want to win? And I think for too long, um, Connecticut's good. education reform space wanted to be right. Like, this is what we need to do. They were trying to like convince the legislature this is the right thing to do. But the reality is, and like, like to put it plainly, right, we have a lot of amazing legislators, but for the most part, right, like what are people really focused on getting reelected? Right. And like what we say is like every politician might not care about kids, but every politician knows how to count. And whether they count votes. So we were not bringing and engaging constituents in this issue because it's like too complicated. And the, you know, um, policy folks and wonks were like having these very intellectual conversations about school finance. But with all of the other bills and all of the other issues, our issue was getting lost in the school during legislation and at the end of the day when you are a state rep or a state senator representing one of those 169 municipalities you want to know how does this impact my people my town what's the bottom line what can i go back in this election year and say i'm bringing to my community and we were not having that type of conversation um so i think unfortunately fortunately the perfect storm was this right like it was the pandemic right it was george floyd's murder right and the racial reckoning that we saw across the country like one of the things that we said was you know um in a lot of suburbs in connecticut right, folks were you know getting together leading black lives matter marches talking about racial equity talking about racial justice and it's like okay let's turn those slogans into actual policy change right if you really want to bring equity and bring justice to black people in this state you have to close this and for the pandemic, one of the things that we said, like, you know, like kids in Westport, Connecticut went home with iPads at the beginning of the pandemic and kids in Bridgeport went home with I hope. Like, I hope I'll have internet connection. I hope this tablet that they gave me will work. And we really leaned into the racial funding gap at a time when the governor was really, um, Connecticut was on the, the lead, the scoring board, like how we were dealing with the pandemic. So we use that as an opportunity. And we also recently had our Commission of Education transition to become the Secretary of Education. So all of that, like, there was an opportunity to honestly publicly shame Connecticut for what was going on in our own backyard. So, and, and then we also made sure that we connected legislators 
not just to like, this is the right thing to do and this is the policy, but making sure that they were in front of their constituents, their voters, whether they're an urban district or a suburban district saying, hey, if you want to be elected, you have to pass this bill if you want my support. Um, so those are some of the things that we were able to do. Like we stopped having the conversation about policy and started having the conversation about power and what right. folks who represent us need to do. Um, and again, all of the conditions across the country, but especially in the state of Connecticut, um, made it very, I guess, good to begin to have the conversation about racial funding gaps, to get at the bigger systemic issues around our formula. Wonderful, thanks for sharing that. Um, John, I'd, I'd love to hear kind of the, the Illinois context and sort of what was the catalyst, what created the political will inside the Capitol to do this work. Well, first of all, maybe I could just uh, give you my perspective, the challenges that we had. And this, I think, is the same for most states. There's, a, there's a, only a certain amount of money. There's a think of a pie chart. And uh, uh, over half of states' budgets are out the door because they're they're non-discretionary. They're they're for pensions or they're for Medicaid formulas or labor contracts. So you're fighting, if you will, for the remaining amount of money. And who are you fighting with? Well, think about it. You're fighting for higher ed money, for elementary, uh, for uh, uh, early childhood money, and you're fighting with social services. Some of the legislators who care about that the most, uh, you know, are also supportive of reforming education. So you have this intramural fight. And again, as a legislative leader, you know, you get, you represent the middle of that caucus. But when you have a horrible formula, as we did, you have to, and Jamel, I love the way you talked about the fact that you have to, you know, let's get something done. But you gotta be a half a loaf person. You can't just say, I gotta have the perfect because you'll get nothing. And so, and that's when you come into how to, how to change it. Um, and, and in the absence of, you know, raising taxes, which is really difficult, uh, you gotta kind of just, intramurally have a, have have some fights and and so then when you get interest groups that that could be in illinois we have a group called advanced illinois that i'm on the board now which is fantastic it was the leading uh, re, uh, reform group uh to to push this and educate legislators um you, you, also we have a unions in illinois so unions are going to play a role as well not every state has that so the reform groups are, are key um because uh, and then the part about just to give you an example of how you have to do the half a loaf we have like eight billion dollars in the school aid formula and we came up with a great reform but at the end of the day you know you have another chamber you have to pass the bill you have a governor who's in for a different party um so you you have to really work a system and and then as a result you end up in, in our case we had like a hold harmless so nobody lost any money but the new money went through uh this great funding formula and the governor literally in illinois just yesterday gave a a budget speech for another like I don't know, five or six years in a row now an extra 350 million dollars is going through this great formula so that's kind of like the the message i would say to people you gotta work hard but you gotta understand what your challenges are yeah and i'm curious i mean i think you know just to, to stick with you for just a second john two follow-up questions one is in terms of sort of um bringing kind of the legislature along. I think I've observed in our work in, in different states, there's kind of a wide range of, of knowledge, capacity, experience with, with school finance. It can be really complicated. Um, it's very technical um, kind of work. You know, what, what's kind of the pre-work involved in sort of setting up the conditions to have this debate? And then sort of thinking back um, on some of the comments that Jamila made about the 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 conditions that kind of led to things, the pressure coming from the outside of the Capitol. Um, so, would yeah. love to hear your reaction to that. Illinois is, we'd like to think, kind of a microcosm of, this, of the nation. We've got some rural, uh, deep south rural areas. We've got suburbs where they're fairly wealthy, pretty wealthy, and in a, a city of Chicago, which is you know racially divided. Um, but to educate people about the conditions that are existing in the schools. I mean, people wouldn't know that in Streeter, Illinois, or some little town, there's only enough money for four days of school. I mean, people don't even know that. The uh, Jamel's point about the iPads versus, you know, the not even having an internet. Those things you have to educate people because you know legislators are trying to do the right thing. They're also trying to get reelected, as she said, and represent their district. And so 
Uh, and you really do have to have a champion. I mean, I say champion, I mean a legislator. Uh, and we had happened to have that in, in Illinois. And you, you have to have somebody that's really uh, takes, takes, takes it um, and, and brings it to the attention. The media clearly is a, has a big role uh, and more and more uh, all the time in terms of using social media. So you gotta, um, you gotta come up with a, a, a formula that's fair that you can sell to people and it, it's not going to be 100% of what you want. It just can't be. It's not going to work. Um, kind of sticking with that theme a little bit, Jamila, you mentioned uh, coalition. Um, and I would love to, to hear your thoughts on sort of how co coalition building played a role in your work, plays a role in that work, and how folks should think about convincing or working with people who may be skeptical, who may not always be your friends um, on all issues, um, to sort of join forces and, and drive this work. Yeah. So coalition work is the most important work on the advocacy side to getting this done. It is also the hardest part of getting it done. And I think a couple of things that like we know and have learned about coalitions is that every person should have a role. Every person should be really clear about what their self-interests are and what they need to get out of being a part of a coalition. And I don't believe in like coalitions in perpetuity. Like every coalition should sort of have like a time-bound goal because there are organizations, so what we say is no permanent allies, no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. And there are people you might work on, um, work with, excuse me, on one issue, not on another. And so it's really important. So like coalitions are a sacred space. And I find that like wh what I've seen is like, everyone wants everybody to join the coalition. The coalition be 50 people. We had a core group five organization. So SPEC was um, community-based, community organizing, and the three largest cities in the state, what we brought was that manpower, that voting power. We knew that the governor won his last elections by 40,000 votes, and 60,000 of those votes came from Bridgeport, Harvard, and New Haven, right? So that's what we brought. Um, the Senate president is my um, senator right down the street from me. He's a, he's a New Haven native, right? So like, that's why we're in New Haven. Speaker of the House, is from Hartford, right? And so all of those things matter. The chair of the Appropriations Committee from New Haven. Then we had School and State Finance, um, which is an organization focused on creating policies. Um, that um, specific ed uh, executive director also in a good way had relationships on the other side of the aisle. Um, so we're majority Democrat in power. It's important to engage all parties on the issue. Um, so they were able to draft the bill, like do all the technical stuff, tweak the numbers. And then we had content organization that I previously worked for, um, and their new executive director has incredible relationships in the Capitol, um, and also had a lot of policy and support around what it meant to have an equitable formula. We also had the head of the Charter Association. So charters get slammed in Connecticut. Um, and the, the reality is, when we were talking about the race stuff, 93% of charter school students are Black and Latino. Right. So like whether you support charter schools or not, when we're talking about our kids, we're talking about charter schools. And last but certainly not least with Education for Excellence, the unions have been slamming us related to this issue. And so we needed to make sure um, we got high local, right? Like maybe the Connecticut Education Association doesn't support this, but if the local Hartford American Federation teachers do, then we have power. And really important for us to each have our specific role in order to push the agenda forward. There were other organizations that I would call like allies, supporters, but it was really important that when we made decisions, it was the five of us in the room and other people who agreed with the issue. We weren't debating charters, right? Like there were just certain things that weren't on the table. So if you didn't agree with us, you didn't have to be a part of our coalition. But faith facts, what I would say is like faith facts alone couldn't have gotten the win, um, but we wouldn't have won without faith facts. And the power that we built we didn't decide in 2021 that like, let's start organizing people in Bridgeport, Hartford, and New Haven around this issue. That was a few years in the making. And so I think that's another thing, like with the coalition work and with the community support work, you can't decide that legislative session to do that work. You have to have been doing that for a few years. And you can assume when you put a bunch of people in the room um, with different 
uh, self-interest that they're all going to agree on things. So we fought in rooms. I don't mean like, like, but we had like very difficult discussions, but always came out in a united front. So coalition work is hard though. It's the hardest part. Yeah, absolutely. And John, from your perspective, I, I would imagine um, you may have a, a little bit of a, a different lens on on coalition building given given your role. But you know, I know in observing these kinds of debates, um, they're often they they require bipartisanship. Um, this is an issue in which literally everyone has a dog in the fight. Um, right. Would be curious for for your take on sort of how you think about coalition building around school finance reform. Well, it, uh, I love listening to the experiences in other states, and uh, it's been like I can see why the bill eventually passed with your efforts. Uh, the well, give me an example. You talk about bipartisanship. Um, the rural areas in Illinois tend to be more Republican, and they were the ones that were really and in, and in, in, um, primarily white. Uh, they were the ones that were really not getting very much money. The the wealthier suburban areas in the city of Chicago. Uh, also white were getting, primarily white were getting more money, and they tended to be starting to become more Democrat. So you you really, that it wasn't about the Republican and Democrat when, when these things um, came up to in the legislature. And, and as Jamila said, the, these things take time. This, this was not one year. Keep in mind also, this is uh, my observations because I was there so long, the, the, there used to be a lot more coverage of state government now People really don't know what we do. And yet people do want to, it's funny, they do want to get reelected. So as a result, you know, you have to make sure you're always um, uh, educating people in a way that this is a positive reform, not taking away money from their school districts or raising their property taxes. Remember, property taxes are uh, in Illinois a disproportionate amount of money uh, to, to fund schools. It's not fair. Uh, and you have to, the formula is meant to overcome the unfairness of the school, of the, um, of the school, of the property tax system. And so uh, and there's nothing more sensitive than, than property taxes politically, the third rail. So this is what, these are what the challenges are. And yet, um, you know, legislators want to do the right thing. They just don't want to, you know, not come back. <laughs> so, uh, and that's what, what we eventually uh, were able to do. And again, I, I was more of a, uh, the legislative leaders in most states have an enormous amount of power. You, you, you have the power to, you don't have the power to pass anything you want, but you have the power to kill anything you want. And you have to work, in, in our case, we had um, a Republican governor, I happen to be a Democrat, um, getting um, the Republican governor. Again, the issue was kind of split, so he, was, he, was, he had to sign the bill. But uh, give you another example, at the last minute, we were talking about charter schools. In Illinois, the uh, Catholic schools weighed in at the very end uh, through the actual Cardinal of Chicago and had a had a, a program to help Catholic schools, something the unions, public uh, unions are always opposed to. So we had to kind of finesse that as well. So uh, we eventually we even tied the existence of this formula to the very budget. We were literally ready to not even fund anything in state government until we passed this bill. And that's what it came to and that's what we that's what we did. We passed it. Yeah, we we saw some coverage of of the budget, uh, the the role of the budget in the Illinois um, reform. And Jamila, you had mentioned the budget as well in in your in your intro, and would love for you to expand a little bit on sort of what were some of those levers um, that you all were able to to pull in terms of of strategy for moving this forward. Yeah, so just building off of those like conditions that I said, so we knew that um, last year was a long legislative session, it was a budget year, and we knew that when the governor did his state of the state and came out with his budget, we knew that we needed to get out in front of that to sort of frame the education conversation. And so I think a few days before his budget address, excuse me, um, before he uh, shared his budget, we did a press conference. I think it was probably the coldest day that winter, like on legislative, uh, on the steps of the Capitol. It was freezing outside. Like I was pregnant. It was just like all of the like optics for like these people really are out here and care about this. Well, um, we had legislators standing with us as well. And I remember when the articles came out about the governor's budget, it was framed as like he had wanted the the talking point to be like he was um, 
doubling down and investing in education. And it was the governor's like disinvest education, right? So we got a ton of phone calls about the administration being frustrated with that, but that was good. That agitation was good because that gave us leverage going into question. Um, and I think John pointed out legislators who cared about our issue also cared about a lot of other social service issues as well. And so their strategy was so they had a lot of difficult decisions to make. So the strategy there was a there was a there was a policy strategy and there was like this moral issue and then this technical issue. And so in terms of how to work our way to what John said, like legislative leadership. And I think the mistake I see a lot of people making is like they work on this champion who might be a republic, uh, excuse me, um, a representative that cares deeply about the issue, but like do they have power? Do they have juice? Like is there a Senate president or is the speaker going to say, like, I got you and we'll go to for this regardless? I see a lot of people spending time and energy and people that don't have the absolute power to say or no to something. So we started with the education chairs. We got our bill passed out of that committee, overwhelming bipartisan support, 34 to 4. That was great. But at the end of the day, that mattered and that gave us uh, momentum. But then the appropriations committee had to take the governor's budget make a ton of changes. And like um, John was saying, like there's a finite amount of money that you can move around. And so what we then did with the appropriations committee, and in some ways, like, I'm just gonna be really real. Like what we did in the education committee mattered, but like it didn't, right? Because like, it wasn't like that, we didn't pass the bill. It was, that was like the optic necessary for the line and the budget. And a couple of things happened. One, just to get really real, because I think it's important for people to know this. One, um, there's a, there was a spending cap issue. So in previous years, the issue was not enough money. Then we found out we had a surplus. So we're like, great, our price tag is $440 million. We have way more than that in surplus. We can spend it. No, 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 the spending cap, right? So we actually couldn't put that additional money in the budget and didn't, I think you needed two thirds vote um, in the legislature in order to increase the spending cap. We didn't do the political work to get those two thirds vote because we didn't know that that was going to be an issue. Um, another issue that came out was the billions of federal dollars coming into the state. We didn't anticipate that. So how are we asking for more money when billions of dollars are coming into the state for education? So, and then the other thing, um, an unfortunate thing is one of the chairs of the appropriations committee had like a personal medical emergency and ended up taking off time. We didn't anticipate that either. All of those things happened. And at the end of the day, what really mattered is a couple of things. We ended up the tactic that we use that Faith Act physically wraps the Capitol in prayer, social distancing with all of our pastors. The Speaker of the House was on the floor. He found out that some of his key pastors in his neighborhood were there, like in Hartford. So he came out and made a public commitment to hold the line on our issue in the bill. The Senate president wasn't there. And so what we did is when we had a meeting with him, we brought a pastor from New Haven that he knows um, that pastor's late brother, actually a legislator who worked with this Senate president in the past, right? So that relationship mattered. So we made sure that meeting that the right person was making the ask and he recommitted again. So once they went into closed door negotiations, we did all the work that we needed to do with the legislative leadership to hold the line. And while we didn't get support from the governor that said like, yes, I support this. What we did get was that he didn't block it, right? And sometimes you don't need support from people, but I think as John pointed out, you just need them to not kill it or to veto the bill or to veto the budget. Um, so it was messy. And I think that like the key takeaway for folks is when you're trying to get something like this done, like not only do you need like years runway to get there, but when you're in the session, there were so many points where something could have gone wrong. And I think if we just fixated on carrying it through the education committee and didn't focus on another committee and didn't focus on legislative leadership and didn't focus on making sure the governor didn't block our issue. If we weren't doing all of those things at the same time, we wouldn't have gotten the things that we needed to get done that legislative session. Thanks for that. I think that really underscores how critical the role of both advocates and policymakers are in this this work. And John, I would be interested in your kind of reaction, response, and thoughts on sort of uh, 
what is it that policymakers can sort of most benefit from coming from the advocacy community when you're trying to get something done? What are you hoping well, for from advocates? I love listening to uh, Jamila's re uh, uh, rendition of the sausage making. That's why they call it sausage making, right? And, and people say, why, why do you guys, why don't you just pass a bill? Again, they don't understand how it works, but it's very, very complicated. It's, as I said before, it's really easy to kill a bill. It's really hard to pass a bill. And especially with all these um, um, nuances. I mean, I, I mentioned just briefly unions and in some states unions are, are huge. They are big uh, political supporters, both parties, uh, and they get uh, conflicted. You know, normally it's not like, oh, unions are for more money for education, sure, but where does it go? That's what we're talking about here. And so there's another example of how you, you just have to, it, it's just really, really difficult. But coming back to the original point, other than, you know, we spend money on healthcare, but m over every state in the nation, most of them, uh, their biggest, their, the state government itself is like 10%. Governments are big pass-throughs, uh, uh, money for social services, as I mentioned, uh, uh, higher ed, elementary and secondary, and, and early childhood. And and so it's just very, very complicated. You have to be willing to compromise. You have to be willing to get half a loaf. We've gotten a couple of questions bubbling up from, from the audience. So I wanna kind of take a little bit of a left turn um, and, and, and ask some of these. So um, Jamila, for you, um, and I'm just reading, reading this question here, you say there are no permanent coalitions and that you ally with people based on the specific issue. But at the same time, there were red lines like not collaborating with anti-charter groups. How do you decide what those sort of bright lines are and how much overlap is enough? Um, and this person is asking because funding fights can sometimes create strange alliances. Um, and you know, how should advocates be thinking about making decisions around those kinds of partnerships? That's a good question. And I think it's issue by issue. And so we have worked with organizations and groups that are quote unquote, I would say like anti-charter and not supportive of charter on other issues. But when we met with, so I am the only people that I'm beholden to 100% of the time are those people I talked about in the beginning, like those 80 churches and those 500 members. So once we decided what, our, what we wanted to and what our goal was, we only went into coalition with folks that agreed with that. And so we decided early on, we did our own research that at the end of the day, in terms of schools of choice, 93%, like I said, of those students are black and brown, and they're overwhelmingly in Bridgeport, Hartford, and New Haven. So when we're talking about our kids, we're talking about those schools. So we decided early on that not making sure that equitable funding was across the to all schools was a non-negotiable for us for this specific issue, right? So we might work on something like minority teacher recruitment and might work with someone who is not supportive of charter schools. And I think specifically for context, I know state by state is different, but the state of Connecticut has 11 different funding formulas, um, different types of schools of choice. And um, there's a misconception that charter schools take money away from traditional public schools in this state. And while I can't see other states that's not happening in the state of Connecticut, um, and in some cases, double funding kids um, and not funding them at the seat in school that they actually attend. And that's overwhelmingly happening more with like business schools and other schools of choice as well. So I think just to like be very specific on the answer, I think that you have to decide that with people, whoever your people are, and then when you decide on that and that issue, you can hold the line with that specific coalition on that issue. But again, another um, education reform issue, we would be able to potentially partner with those folks. But on this issue, we were not going to, because that happened too, like part of the negotiations, like let's take charters out of this and we have to hold the line and say, no, like this isn't a win for us and we're walking away from the table if charters aren't included, if MAGA schools aren't included, if vocational technical schools aren't included um, in this equity. Thank you. Um, one more question from the audience um, that, oh, she's back. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if either of you will have a perspective on this, um, but, um, and it sounds like John, you'd mentioned hold harmless in, in your voiceover. So this may not be true, but 
if there were any losers to the reform of the, the funding formula, any districts that got pushed into the red, um, how do you make the case that all, although some districts, some schools may lose funding due to the changes, it's it's more fair? How do you kind of get that across? We actually tried to end up having losers, but we weren't able to pass that because the other chamber decided to the politically there'd be a fallout. And it was, and again, because both parties are sort of on the same in this area are both in the same they have conflicts across the board it didn't happen but you know you have to go to a broader audience the business community wants to have educated folks in their state uh, that, that helps them, them make money the poor areas of the state will uh, uplift themselves if the educational system is improved um, uh, it, it's even within like the city of chicago uh, you had people used to be fleeing the, the city for the suburbs. The, 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 the uh, school system was uh, was uh, brought up and improved in, in people's state. So there's there's examples of that that you can appeal to uh, uh, legislators, and they're trying to do the right thing. But at the same time, as as uh, Jamal was mentioning, you have to you have to know how to count. You have to know how to count, and and you have to get the votes. And so, and there's these. Sometimes you just have to uh, make compromises. And in our case, you know, we we did have to really give up. Uh, uh, instead of reforming an eight billion dollar formula, we we uh, end up having to uh, stop the bleeding and start uh, all new money going in this great formula. And it's really it does build up after time. It just takes longer. Uh, and that's just the part that you have to, uh, you, you have to learn how to, how to um, compromise. That's, that's, otherwise you'll get nothing done. And we've been saying that a number of times, but I think that's the one thing people are taking from this, from our experiences. Jamila, do you have thoughts on that? On, um, you know, what do you do when, when there's losers or how do you manage that? Yeah, we had to decide that last year to um, John point the hold harmless clause. Um, were we going to, take money away and redistribute money or we were going to add or were we going to add money to the pot and what we had to decide is we didn't have enough power to have losers right and so i think in the state of connecticut our opinion at ASAC is that we cannot in the long term fund schools based on property taxes and even with the um wonderful work that we did with the education cost sharing formula um to john's point right like it like fundamentally is broken and when we have enough here to radically transform it and start from scratch we'll do that but we, we decided and did some analysis of our own power that we didn't have enough power or juice to get that done um this past legislative session and that's going to be a hard lift because all the stuff that john was talking about in terms of local property taxes and we'll feel about that um these little rooms in connecticut like that that's going to be a heavy lift um and so when we get there i think we can sort of figure that out and i do think there are some messages around and i don't i don't like this doesn't all resonate with our people and i don't all of these messages but like pay now or pay later and so i think what some folks need to understand is like the bigger picture in terms of the state of connecticut like there are other social services that we're paying for because we're not educating kids right and so like we need to do a better job of people seeing the whole picture. Like your municipality might get a little less money from the um, from the state related to what you're able to put into your public schools, but um, overall, the health of the Connecticut economy will be better if we have more folks coming out of school that are eligible to go to college, that can thrive in college, and that can become like working and contributing folks to your, you know, like broader communities that is a harder sell though right and so and that takes time and that takes like political capital to be able to make that argument to be able to go back to your district and say we won and i'm bringing back less money that's hard to do yeah um that's a great segue to to my next question which is you know we've, we've talked a lot about sort of the the sort of nitty gritty of, of working inside the capital but as we think about the work outside of the capital and public engagement. Um, I think one thing that we've seen as a challenge across states is, is that it can be hard to sort of get public engagement on debates about school finance because it quickly becomes very technical, very complicated. There are formulas, there are spreadsheets, um, and it's complex policy. 
Um, curious if you encountered this challenge in your states, and if so, what do you, what do you do to help translate these policy proposals for for constituents or other sort of stakeholder groups in the public at, at large? We can start with with John. I, you know, it's ironic that uh, last couple of years with the pandemic, uh, we are all aware that there's been some you know politicization about issues dealing with the school, and in Chicago we had another um, unfortunately another. Um, uh, slow down uh, for a few few days and people uh, were out of school. Um, but it's I think it's also at the same time um, uh, engendered more interest in in local school councils and uh, what the what the teachers are, are role is and how important the teachers are. And 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 by the way, there's been more federal money. Uh, and I think every state in the nation has had more money. Uh, uh, the the uh, I had an experience with a with a uh, remote learning, which was you know I actually had a, a grandson that was at our house remote learning for a whole year, and the only positives are that you get to look at the teacher and you get to look at the other kids, uh, but the, for the most part it's it, it's obviously was a not a positive thing. So you so you have more interest now, and the teachers have as they should because I was a substitute teacher and Jamal was a teacher. There's probably nothing harder to do in America, and we have a shortage of teachers uh, because of I think just because of the way we fund it. And, and so in general, so uh, I think maybe because of this interesting uh, twist of what's happened, maybe there will be more, um, more people focused on improving the schools. Jamil, a thoughts on kind of that sort of broader public engagement, sort of the winning of hearts and minds um, of, of regular people who don't spend a lot of time with their head in this space. Yeah, so I, I actually like think we overcomplicate the issue, right? And, you know, it is technical, but I think it's like our job to be able to figure out like what's the, if I'm in a grocery store and I see somebody I know, like what's the one to five minute version of this? And I do think this gets down to like communications and messaging and the simplicity of storytelling. And so like for us, um, like I'll just share like a concrete example of that. Um, one of the talking points that we had is on a street in Fairfield County, a school educating a Bridgeport child receives $14,000 per child for education. While a fair school receives 18,000 per child. These children are neighbors and very well may play together. That's a $4,500 gap on the same street. And so like, that school finance in Connecticut, like in a nutshell. Right. And I give that example to say like, there are opportunities to have these conversations with folks. And from our perspective, so we are, we do congregations organizing, which means we understand the, the power of churches and communities that they reside in. We can't use communication tactics that work for other people. We have to use communication tactics that work for church folks. So what this would mean, pre-pandemic, pandemic, it got very hard, but like after we got, we built a relationship with the pastor after church service, let's have lunch together, let's break bread together, and let's have a conversation about uh, school funding. And we would do, you know, some of the technical imagery and slides of like, this is how much we spend, we a lot of comparisons, like city to city, but also like what you the city spends on this versus what the spends on that and then we would break it down to stories like what's your experience in your school do you have kids at different schools are you experiencing different things and we also let community folks own the research have you asked your principal for their for their budget have you asked the district for um, a common chart of account so that we can compare different schools or for the state so that we can compare different schools like do you know what your school spends on educated classroom materials and so really trying to like make it connected to people's everyday experiences and, and empowering our folks to be the experts. We partnered with school and state finance and we did, I want to say like a two to three month intensive leadership opportunity for folks to dive into school and state finance. And we went into the education cost sharing formula. We went into the history of it. We went into the history of like the, the constitution and the fact that education is not a Constitution right and like the federal dollars we get versus the state versus the local we can't do that with everyone though and so I do think that like organizations like mine for folks doing this work always have to play a role like if you think you're not going to engage community and 
have meaningful conversations with community, but then you go to legislators and you're talking, it's sort of like the Charlie Brown, like, womp, womp, womp. They're <laughs> like, these are my people in my community. Like, what do they have to say about it? And I just think that we have to, I honestly just don't think it's as hard as we make it. I just think it's taking the time to do it and just meeting people where they are, not where you want them to be. And we overcomplicate it, right? So like, how do we just keep it simple? And everyone doesn't need to know the ends of I don't know. <laughs> like when I was doing this work for a very long time, it, it is like, you know, not the easiest thing to follow, but like, how do we make it accessible for people and meaningful for people and connect it to students? Boy, I just wish Jamela was lobbying me in Illinois. That would have been fun. She's great. She is great. Um, and I think one thing that we've heard fairly consistently kind of across the various ways of engaging different stakeholders throughout this conversation is time. Um, that it takes time to build knowledge, to build comfort, to build coalition. Um, we have a question from the audience um, for you, John, about how were you able to move representatives in rural areas or outside of large cities to stand with you, given the significant impact changing funding formulas would have in the city centers? So how do you sort of bring along your, your rural friends? Yeah, as I indicated earlier, the rural areas uh, primarily have been shifting politically from uh, Democrats to Republicans. So we're talking about getting support from the other party. And, you know, uh, it, the states are so divided now between the parties and so polarized. Polarized. There's only I don't think there's any states left where one chamber is a different party than the other. It's uh, it's terrible in a way. But in this particular area, you've got a reason to work with the other party. And so, get working with those downstate legislators. Um, uh, and and um, the problem is always in a, a, a it's in Illinois. I'm sure it's other states. It's the big city, like in New York, would be the the big city is the you know the boogeyman, and they're 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 getting all the money, which wasn't true. It was just quite frankly a little bit of the opposite. So you just have to you just have to. Uh, the problem was in the areas where there's the wealthier areas where there the formula was, and this happens nationally where they're getting more money, and you just it's tough to take it away from them. And so you just have to come up with this this intramural fight. There's always going to be somebody, even the social service providers or or, or to the extent that you can you can change a formula or, or hold some even harmless so that you can get new money going the way it's always going to be a sacrifice and so you just have to be um, uh, you have to be diligent and you have to be willing to do you know work with coalitions. Jamila, I would invite your comments there on kind of the the rural urban dynamic, um, obviously very present in Connecticut as well. Yes. And I will say this is something we haven't done a good job with. And like, particularly me, like we primarily represent urban um, folks. And, but what made it necessary this year to make sure that um, the rural community in Connecticut was taken care of, our, um, one of our co-chairs of the Appropriations Committee, um, Senator Kathy Austin, um, is from a rural area. So she made it very clear, like, you ain't getting my support unless it's is good for my people. And so I think that our strategy was, well, I don't represent rural communities. It was good that we're having early conversations with her to understand what she needed to get out of our bill. And if we hadn't done that, and if it was at the point where we needed the appropriations to pass the budget that held our line out of committee, we, it would have been too late to do that. And so what the school and state finance was able to do consistently is every time we talk about like who are, who's being taken care of, who's not taken care of, are we whipping the votes? Do we have the votes? Um, we were able to make the tweak to formula and to John like that compromise, right? And make people were taken care of. And that and equity was important to us too, right? And making sure that rural students um, right. got what they needed. Sometimes yeah. I think in, school, in, in terms of the student count, it can appear that we are spending a lot more in rural areas, potentially because of the number of students. And then I also think some people forget that a lot of schools of choice also in, exist in rural areas as well and don't impact um, black and brown students and urban students. 
Awesome. Well, we are we are getting close to time and there's a few questions uh, from our audience left. So I'm just going to preview a couple of those topics, but then invite John and Jamila to offer any closing comments. Um, and I see the question in the chat around recommendations on podcasts, articles and books. Why, yes, we do have recommendations. Um, Bonnie had previously put in the chat a link to um, Bellwether's work on, on school finance, um, she mentioned at the beginning of the, the webinar, our series Splitting the Bill, which is a series of nine two-ish page briefs um, that really provide some of that nuts and, but, nuts and bolts, um, School Finance 101. Um, and keep an eye on that site because we're going to keep building more of those tools and resources. And then Jeannie Pupa Walker from EdTrust Tennessee also posted a link to, to their work on this issue. Um, and I would, I would also recommend that as a place to go. Um, so the couple of questions we have left, um, one is regarding um, another stakeholder constituency that we haven't talked about, which is state boards of education. Um, and you know, the role that they can play um, in, in these processes. So if either of you have perspectives on that, and then we have kind of a, an existential question um, around school districts. Um, if the funding is so tied up with district lines, attendance zones, and educational redlining, how can we have equitable finance reform if kids are still assigned to schools based on where they live? So no requirement that you respond to either of those, but invite you to say what, what you would most like to say in our, in our waning two minutes. You know, consolidation of school districts in Illinois, it's been around for 40 years. It's impossible to do it. It's so diff difficult. In Chicago, we have one school district, so it's not an issue for Chicago. Um, it's really, really difficult. And that's why these formulas have to be altered uh, to overcome uh, the, the diversions. One school district has a nuclear power plant in it, and they've got so much money, and the other one, a block away, doesn't, as, as Jamal was talking about before. So it's it's just a, and it's a really, really difficult thing to change because there's debt involved, and there's people that went to that high school, and they don't want to have it closed. It's just a, it's a, it's a nightmare. So I, I think uh, that's a really tough issue that the, changing the school form is, has to over, try to overcome that. I don't know about Jamal's thought on that, but that's my thought. I envision a Connecticut where a child, regardless of where they live, their race, what their parents do for a living, get to decide the public school that works best for them, whether that's across the street from their house or an hour away from their house. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. Right. So I, I don't think we'll ever get to equity um, until we eradicate the current funding formula in the state of Connecticut. And I remember asking the question like this, this racial funding gap, can we ever close it in the current system? And the answer is no. And so like we are on a pursuit to close the racial funding gap. Um, we are evaluating our power and how long it's gonna take to get there. But I am hopeful that the state of Connecticut um, and the leaders position that they are um, recognize and understand that in order to continue to occupy those seats, we're going to have to make some pretty radical and transformational change. Um, and it's going to be really hard. And just quick answer to the State Board of Education. I don't know how state boards work in other states, but in the state of Connecticut, there are appointed positions um, for, the, for the administration and for the governor. And I think in general, like having State Board of Education members within more is important because in state of Connecticut, even though they're like technically appointed, right, and like, you know, the, the administration holds a heavy hand over them, that is not the perception of the public. So the public actually thinks that the State Board of Education has a lot more technical authority than it does. And I think that the State Board of Education should use that to its advantage um, to weigh in on these conversations. They think that they operate more like local boards of education. And I honestly, like lovingly like state board of education needs to stop occupying seats but they're not going to say anything or do anything um, on these issues all right well thank you so much big thanks to to our panelists today and to all of our audience members for joining us today and talking about school finance over potentially your lunch break um really appreciate it thank you so much